Do you have patients who are picky eaters? Do you have family members who are picky eaters? Are you curious about why we have the appetite concerns and food choices we have? I'm Dr. Brian McDonough. I'm your host for Primary Care today on Reach MD, And my guest today is Marsha Levin Pelshaw. Dr. Pelshaw is a psychologist. She is an associate member of the Monell Chemical Senses Center. She has written numerous articles, and we're going to talk about some of them. She's a board member of the American Institute of Wine and Food and Les Dames de Scaffier, also editorial board member of Appetite. What a fascinating career and area of study. And I'll start out with how would you get into it? What piqued your interest in this? Well, my mother was a terrible cook, <laughs> and and that's the way that, although both parents were very interested in good food, so at the age of eight, I started cooking. Uh, both of my parents were chemists, and I thought I'd grow up to be a scientist, but I didn't know that I could pursue my hobby as my vocation. And when I uh, got to college, I I found out that there were people who studied many different aspects of food. And at the time, I was a physics major, which I have to say is a lot easier than what I do. Wow. Uh, You know, you know when you have the right answer. When I found out that I could study food as a scientist, I went right out and changed my major. And you have written some fascinating papers. One of the ones that I just latched onto and was curious about was a whole concept of food addiction in humans. Back in 2009, in the Journal of Nutrition, you wrote about that. And then again, you wrote about it later in 2010 in Current Opinions in Gastroenterology. So you had addressed the issue of food addiction, true or false. Is it a true issue? Is it, is, does it not exist? Well, um, what I and and many others now have discovered is that there are similar brain mechanisms engaged whenever we desire something. And that can be food, it can be cigarettes or alcohol, it can be um, shoes or Beethoven or romantic love. Um, And a paper that I published in uh, 2004 was uh, on similarities in brain mechanisms between food and drug cravings. And in fact, yes, there is a lot of overlap. Does that mean that, that food is addictive and evil and, you know, the cause of the obesity epidemic Well, obviously, eating too much food is involved in the obesity epidemic. But the fact that desire for food and desire for cigarettes and alcohol use the same brain mechanisms doesn't mean that food is bad. It means that, say, cigarettes and alcohol are bad uh, because they're able to take over these Uh, brain circuits that evolve to make people take care of themselves, to nourish themselves, to reproduce, take care of their children, and they cause people to not take care of themselves so well because they can stimulate these reward pathways more strongly or more quickly than natural rewards can. A lot of people ask me whether uh, having a craving for a food is the same thing as being addicted to it. And that I can give a really clear answer to. That answer is no. If you look at the DSM-5, and I assume since your listeners are physicians, they know that the DSM is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Psychiatric Disorders. Food addiction is not a recognized disorder, but um, substance dependencies and addictions are. And even for those that are recognized in the DSM, you need multiple symptoms in order to qualify for a diagnosis. And craving is only one of many symptoms. And, uh, you know, so, so if you crave something,
something, but that's it, you would not be diagnosed as being dependent or addicted. You know, when you talk about food and craving, um, you've also written about the olfactory sense, the sense of smell, and its mm-hmm. impact on food. It does have a big impact, and as people age, and maybe they don't have as great of an olfactory system, it can impact how they eat. Yes, yes, it definitely can. Now, most people uh, don't notice uh, the decline in uh, olfactory sensitivity with age because in most cases it's gradual. Sometimes, especially as people get older, if they have a very bad upper respiratory tract infection, they can have a sudden decline in olfactory sensitivity. But for the most part, it's gradual. And when people are living out in the community, then yeah, maybe they're brewing a stronger cup of coffee or tea or you know something like that. But they don't really notice the change. Yet, when we bring them into the laboratory, it's very obvious. If I give people uh, pureed fruits, they might not be able to tell them apart if they don't know what they're supposed to be. Um, You know, so if I give them a pear puree versus an apple puree, they, they can't tell. Now, of course, why don't they notice this in real life? Well, At home, if they're cooking, they're preparing the food, they know it's an apple pie or a strawberry rhubarb pie or whatever. They can see the color and they they have lots of other cues. And they can fill in from memory for a lot of the missing sensory stimulation. Um, So if I say, okay, here's a pear puree, what do you think of it? People will say, oh, that's delicious, wonderful, tastes just like a fresh pear. Yet if I don't tell them it's pear, they can't identify it. So, you know, that's unfortunate for those of us who do taste and smell research because if people were more aware of, of the decline that takes place with age, they would complain more to their congressman and maybe we'd get more funding. But why should we care about this? How can this affect health and nutrition? And the answer is that people don't uh, detect food spoilage as well when they have a decline in the sense of smell. And yet they think they do because everybody thinks that their sense of smell is just fine. Uh, They don't notice when uh, there's a gas leak. They don't notice smoke as soon. And there are things that can be done about this if the public were aware of this more. Um, For example, you can buy a gas leak detector for an elderly parent who has a bad sense of smell. But people just aren't very aware of these problems. And there are also issues of personal hygiene that, you know, older people don't know when they need to bathe. And, of course, you know, some that that seem kind of funny, like wearing too much perfume and offending people in elevators. But what's actually bothersome and has more of an effect on nutrition for the elderly are taste phantoms. That would be metallic or bitter tastes that that persist. And these are often side effects of medication. And distortions are particularly disturbing. You eat something that's supposed to be sweet, and instead it's, it's metallic or bitter. And these are things that really make it difficult for people to eat. And also, with head and neck radiation, if there's a loss of sense of taste, not so much smell, but taste, people find it almost impossible to eat because it seems as though they're putting sand or clay in their mouths, not food. If you're just tuning in, you're listening to Primary Care Today on ReachMD. I'm your host, Dr. Brian McDonough. I'm talking with Dr. Marsha Levin-Pelshaw. She is with the Monell Chemical Senses Center. 
Uh, she is a Ph.D. professor who talks about mechanisms of food cravings, food preferences in the elderly. Are there things that can be done? I mean, I know there are some patients of mine. They could be 25, 30 years old. They don't have sinus issues. They don't have other problems. They come in and they say, you know, doctor, my family tells me that I don't smell roses, that I don't smell perfume. I don't seem to smell anything, but then sometimes I smell a strange smell that nobody else smells in the room, and I'm convinced that, you know, they're really telling me the truth, that there is mm-hmm. no smell, but I smell it. What is that all about? What seems to be going on with with those people is possibly that they've had some damage to their olfactory system, but it's regenerating. And the olfactory system is is fascinating because the receptors are hanging out there exposed to the environment. And because they're in such a hostile setting, they regenerate. And uh, they're constantly turning over. And in fact, they're the only central nervous system neurons that do this in adults. And so they're very interesting from the point of view of neural regeneration and and studies uh, that might apply to spinal cord injuries and things like that. But getting back to the 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 issue of uh, sense of smell and and smelling strange smells and not being very sensitive, the olfactory nerves go up through little holes in the base of the skull called the cribriform plate. And as I'm sure your listeners know, the brain is floating in fluid, yet your olfactory epithelium, where your olfactory receptors are at the top of the nasal cavity, is fixed. And it's not uncommon during head injuries and, and of course, during some surgeries where the the brain has to be lifted for the olfactory nerve to be severed. Now, if those holes remain clear, the normal regeneration process can cause some return of the sense of smell, but at first, things may not be connected up the way they used to be. And smell olfaction is really a a learned sense. And so experience is required for things to sort of begin smelling like themselves again. We also are beginning to have evidence that doing a lot of sniffing, thinking about smells learning to identify new smells can help to prevent olfactory losses and help people to recover some sense of smell after an injury. So learning seems to be very important. Experience seems to be very important in a well-functioning sense of smell. We're wrapping it up now. We only have about a minute or so, but I wanted to ask you a little bit more about the picky eater. We started off with that, and I know you've done work on that. Why are some kids picky eaters, some people picky eaters throughout their lives, and and what leads to that? Well, it's normal for kids to go through a period when they're picky. Most kids outgrow it, but some never do. And there are many influences on this. You know, we tend to blame the parents and say, well, maybe the parents didn't expose the kids to enough foods. That can play a role, but there can also be genetic influences. There is some evidence that willingness to try new foods has some genetic component. I want to thank you, Dr. Pelshot, for joining us. We talked a lot about the sense of smell and taste and learned a great deal about an issue that I know most physicians really don't talk about much, but it's so important to their patients. Thanks again for joining us. My pleasure. This is Dr. Brian McDonough. If you missed any of this discussion, please visit ReachMD.com slash Primary Care Today to download the podcast and learn more on the series. Thank you once again for listening.